Thank you for all the kind regards. We're going across to Vicky Foxcroft. Vicky Foxcroft. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. As a shielded person, I'm grateful to once again contribute to Parliament. Many shielded people have contacted me, worried about government guidance on going for walks. They want a safe hour walk for shielded people, similar to that adopted in many other countries. Will he do that? They also want more transparency on the shielding list with each category named and risk published. Will he provide that? And finally, will he agree to review the furlough scheme so shielded people in the future are not penalised? Minister. Thank you, sir. The threat and breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration for Hong Kong is just the latest evidence of China's increasingly overt rejection of the rules of international fair play. The Communist Party of China expresses derision for the West's short-termism and lack of unity, so let's prove them wrong. Would my right honourable friend consider publishing a consultation paper for the development of a long-term strategy for our national and pan-national engagement with China? Minister. of the opposition, Sir yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister on his comments on Grenfell, a dreadful night, and his comments on the Duke of Edinburgh, and of course his best wishes to you, Mr Speaker. Can I also say I listened carefully to what the Prime Minister just said on furlough for those newly shielding, and can I welcome that? That has been something we've been concerned about. We'll look at the proposal when it's put on the table, but I'm grateful that he's listened to that and for what he said this morning. Um, the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, on Monday said that feelings of black and minority ethnic groups about discrimination are founded on a cold reality. I agree with him about that. There have been at least seven reports into racial inequality in the last three years alone, but precious little action. For example, most of the recommendations in the Lamy report into inequality in the criminal justice system have yet to be implemented three years after the report was published. Similarly, the long-delayed and damning report by Wendy Williams into the Windrush scandal has yet to be implemented. I spoke last night to black community leaders, and they had a very clear message for the Prime Minister. Implement the reports you've already got. So can the Prime Minister now turbocharge the government's responses and tell us when he'll implement in full the Lamy report and the Windrush recommendations? Prime Minister. Keir Starmer. ...the reports, and obviously we'll hold him to it. He will appreciate that people do notice when recommendations are made and then not implemented, so it's very important um, that they are implemented in accordance with those reports. Um, Mr Speaker, the latest report um, is the Public Health England report on the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. That report concluded that death rates are highest amongst black and Asian ethnic groups. And it went on to say, and this was the important bit, that it's already clear that relevant guidance and key policies should be adapted to mitigate the risk. Already clear. If it is already clear, why has the government not already acted? Here's Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, I, the Prime Minister, I know, understands the frustration from those most at risk when they see a report like that uh, and they know action is needed. And action is needed now, not in a few weeks or months. So can I ask the Prime Minister to complete... Well, perhaps the Prime Minister will indicate whether that's all of the action or whether there's more action. This is a serious issue. We can make progress together. Um, but it is important that it's done uh, swiftly for those most at risk. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I want to turn to the overall numbers of those that have tragically died um, from COVID-19, because those overall numbers haunt us. Since last Prime Minister's questions, the government's daily total figure for those that have died from coronavirus has gone past 40,000. The ONS figure, which records cases where coronavirus is on the death certificate, stands at just over 50,000. And the number of excess deaths, which is an awful phrase, stands at over 63,000. These are amongst the highest numbers anywhere in the world. Last week, the Prime Minister said he was proud of the government's record. But there's no pride in those figures, is there? Prime 
Starmer. Mr Speaker, it just doesn't wash to say that we can't compare these figures to other countries. Everybody can see those figures and see the disparity. And we need to learn from those other countries. What did they do more quickly than us? What did they do differently to us? Because we can learn those lessons uh, and ensure that the numbers come down. And it's little solace to the families that have lost someone to simply be told this is too early uh, to compare and to learn from other countries. And, of course, there will be long-term consequences as a result of the government's approach. I want to turn now to another aspect of government policy, and that's school reopening. We all want as many children back into school as soon as it's possible and as soon as it's safe. What that required for that to happen was a robust national plan, consensus among all key stakeholders and strong leadership from the top. All three are missing. The current arrangements lie in tatters. Parents have lost confidence in the government's approach. Millions of children will miss six months' worth of schooling, and inequality will now go up. Several weeks ago, I suggested to the Prime Minister that we set up a national task force so everybody could put their shoulder to the wheel. It's not too late. Will the Prime Minister take me up on this? Minister. Have this out. The Prime Minister and I have never discussed our letter in any phone call. He knows it and I know it. The task force has never been the subject of a conversation between him and me, one to one, or in any other. Um, secondly, he mentions other countries. Plenty of other comparable countries are getting their children back to school. Wales is an example. Across Europe, there are other examples. We're the outlier on this. And it's no good, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister flailing around trying to blame others. Order, order. But we need to get through with lots of other members so if we can listen to the question, then I certainly want to hear the answers. Keir yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I was saying it's no good the Prime Minister flailing around trying to blame others. A month ago today, he made the announcement about schools without consulting relevant parties, without warning about the dates, and without any scientific backing for his proposal. It's time he took responsibility for his own failures. This mess was completely avoidable. The consequences are stark. The Children's Commissioner has warned of a deepening education disadvantage gap. And she spoke yesterday, her words, the Children's Commissioner, an emerging picture which doesn't give confidence that there's a strategic plan. She called for the government to scale up their response. It must have occurred, it must have occurred to the government that space would be a problem that there would be a need for temporary accommodation and classrooms. They built the Nightingale hospitals. Why are they only starting on schools now? Keir Starmer. I want as many children to go back to school as possible, as soon as possible, as quickly as possible when it's safe. I've been saying that like a like a broken record for weeks on end. I know, he's, I know the Prime Minister's got rehearsed attack lines, um, but uh, he should look at what I wrote from this letter and what I've been saying consistently. Mr Speaker, one way, one way in which the government could help those worst affected would be to extend the national voucher scheme. Because child poverty numbers are so high in this country, 1.3 million children in low-income families rely on these vouchers. They mean children who can't go to school because of coronavirus restrictions still get free meals. The Labour government in Wales has said it will continue to fund these meals through the summer. Yeah. Yesterday, the Education Secretary said that won't be the case in England. That's just wrong, and it will lead to further inequality. So can I urge the Prime Minister to reconsider on this point? Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Britain's new advanced research projects agency is vital to securing our status as a science and technology superpower, particularly as we recover from coronavirus. Can my right honourable friend commit to protecting its funding and its independence so there are no obstacles to it delivering transformational breakthroughs from clean energy to new vaccines? We are now going heading up into Scotland to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on Grenfell, of course, on the 
first year the Duke of Edinburgh and yourself. And Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister told the Liaison Committee, I do not actually read the scientific papers. It is no wonder then, Mr Speaker, that it took the UK so long to act on quarantine measures. The Prime Minister's scientific advisory group weren't even asked for advice on this significant policy. This has been a complete shambles. Too little, too late. We cannot risk ignoring the experts once again. Can the Prime Minister confirm what scientific papers he has read on the two metre social distance rule? Ian Blackford, second. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Of course, we know that the Cabinet has discussed reducing the two-metre social distancing rule, but that's not the experts' advice right now. Sage reported that being exposed to the virus for six seconds at one metre is the same as being exposed for one minute at two metres. That, Mr Speaker, is a significant increase in risk. And the last time Professor Whitty was allowed to attend the daily press briefing, he stressed that the two-metre rule was going to be necessary for as long as the pandemic continues. People are losing confidence in this government. A U-turn on schools, a shambolic rollout of quarantine measures, and now looking to reduce the two-metre rule far too soon. Will the Prime Minister continue to ignore the experts, or will he start following the advice of those who have actually read the scientific papers? Prime Minister. Peter Aldis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Allowing zoos such as Africa Alive near Lowestoft to reopen from 15th June is very good news, as it provides them with a realistic chance of survival. Would the Prime Minister give full consideration to allowing beer gardens to also reopen from 15th June, as the feedback which I'm receiving is that many pubs are now facing the unpalatable and unwanted prospect of having to make staff redundant? Yes. Prime Minister. Geoffrey Donaldson. The Prime Minister will be aware that the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland has today published the guidelines for the special payment scheme for severely injured victims linked to the troubles in Northern Ireland. The Prime Minister will also know that this House passed legislation which excludes those injured by their own hand. But the innocent victims have not yet been able to benefit from this scheme, not least because of the actions of Sinn Féin who are blocking the next steps to implementation. Will the Prime Minister and his Government now commit to do all that they can to move this matter forward so that our most vulnerable of innocent victims can receive this pension? Mr Speaker, many peaceful protests have been held across the country against racism following the appalling events in the US, including in my own constituency yesterday. Can I commend my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, for recognising the significance of these events and as well as scrutinising the health impact of C-19 on ethnic minority groups, can he look again, using the race disparity audit, for any persistent and systemic racism in all government departments, from the treatment of BAME uh, people in the judicial system, through to how we teach children about these issues in our education system? Yeah. Minister. Returning to Scotland with Kirsty Blackman. Kirsty Blackman. Mr. Speaker, the response from the US President to the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matters movement has been horrendous. Can the Prime Minister confirm to me if he still believes Trump has many, many good qualities? And if so, what are they? Prime Minister. Bow of the House of Peter Bottomley. Mr Speaker, I hope you'll allow me to ask the Prime Minister also to welcome the birthday of the Primate of England, the 2007 Yorkshireman of the Year, the Archbishop of York, who is just laying down his crozier after 14 years of service. His great words were that we can share the glories, the struggles, the joys and the pains of this country. Remembering that John Sentamu was tortured in Uganda and served in Tulse Hill 
Stepney, Birmingham, as well as York, and was a crucial, critical advisor to the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. Can I put it to my right honourable friend that if in a period of eight years there are eight interrogations of a bishop each time John sent a move, we've got more to learn about making the colour of one's skin as important as the colour of one's eyes and the colour of one's hair, something you may notice but doesn't tell you any more about them. Shabbat <laughs> Day. Mr Speaker, under suspicionless stop and search powers, which this government is expanding, a black person is 47 times more likely to be stopped and searched than a white person. 47 times. On too many occasions, stop and search seems to mean being black is enough to be suspected of being a criminal. So will the Prime Minister abolish suspicionless stop and search powers and end the pain and injustice they wreak on so many people in Britain's black and minority communities? We're now heading up to the County Palatine of Lancashire with Mark Menzies. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, hospitality and tourism businesses on the Foyle Coast are concerned about their part of long-term recovery and the infrastructure needed to support that. Centrally to this locally is the M55 Link Road, a project which was fully funded and had an issue with some funding allocations. Can the Prime Minister put his weight behind this and help me secure the £5.7 million needed to complete the shovel-ready project? We're now heading up into Scotland with Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Even before the pandemic began, it was clear that the UK has one of the most manifestly inadequate systems of statutory sick pay in the world. We are the second from the bottom in European terms, and it continues to shun millions of workers who are low earners, work in the gig economy, or are self-employed. So as we go back from the crisis in economic terms and make the workplace better, well, the Prime Minister agreed to work with those of us in the opposition fit for the 21st century that can meet people's needs. Heading up to the border of Manchester and Lancashire with Mark Logan. Prime Minister, we've seen much disinformation about the R value in Bolton and the North West. If we have increasingly up-to-date local data, would the Prime Minister then agree with me that correspondingly greater confidence will be given to Boltonians in reopening our businesses, schools and places of worship. Returning to Scotland with Kenny McCaskill. Kenny McCaskill. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, East Lothian prides itself on its food and drink sector, which is gravely threatened by reduced standards in animal welfare and production. Uh, the government failed to enshrine protections in the Agriculture Bill. Earlier this week, ministers equivocated on this issue Will the Prime Minister now take this opportunity to be clear today that high standards will be protected, a Food Standards Commission will be established, and that we won't face chlorinated chicken on our table, along with Kentucky Fried Medicine in our hospitals? Mr. Speaker, due to COVID, we're facing a unique economic challenge. Can I urge the Prime Minister to respond with a major package of infrastructure investment? to create jobs and level up the whole country, including turbocharging the rollout of gigabit broadband, upgrading the Manchester to Sheffield line, and finally building the full Mottram bypass. The people of Glossop have been promised this by politicians for over 50 years. We'll even let him call it the Boris bypass. Let's please just get it built. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents tell me they've lost trust in the government as they're confused by mixed messaging around public health measures, angry that Dominic Cummings seems to have been let off the hook, but they're particularly worried about local jobs and livelihoods due to inadequate support schemes, lack of crisis funding for Luton Council, illogical quarantine impacting Luton Airport. All of this has been on your watch, Prime Minister. How can my constituents feel confident on the proposed next steps for easing lockdown when your government has fallen short so far? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Pre-COVID, the Prime Minister has made a firm commitment to reach into some of the most deprived areas and level up the country. This is needed now more than ever. Will he make a firm commitment and recommit to Whitmarines, Chapel Ash, Penfield and the rest of Wolverhampton so they won't just survive, they will thrive? Good question, Olivia. And many happy returns, Mr Speaker. Today they say that we are free 
just to be ch uh, only to be chained in poverty. Figures, not my words, the words of Bob Marley in 1973. Figures from the Trussell Trust show an 89% increase in emergency food parcels across the UK in April, compared to the same last month, uh, month last year. People are struggling and they need help now. Will the Prime Minister meet with the Chancellor, charities and local government leaders to discuss a much needed funding boost for local welfare assistance schemes in England? Yeah. Prime Minister. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members particip participating in this item of business and safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am now suspending the House for three minutes. Thank you.